So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Frank Solomon. Uh, Frank is uh, Professor Emeritus, um, the John V. Moore uh, Professor Emeritus at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is a longtime uh, student of Andean ethnohistory, having begun his research working in Ecuador and on Quito uh, and on the um, uh, uh, late, uh, late pre-conquest and early colonial world of Quito and subsequently moving into the Andes and doing extraordinarily important work in the central Andes around Guaruchiri and the central highlands. His talk this afternoon is The Long Alternatives of Central Peruvian Quipu Patrimonies. Right. Thank you, Gary. Well, now we all know that in Gary's stunning new book, We've been given so much. Ethno-history at last has what it always lacked. Sources not just about the Inca Empire, but from it. And anal historiography is not a bad way to think about it, as Gary has suggested, insofar as it centrally concerns the interaction of Andean ideal structures, which we know fairly well through chronicles and scholars like uh, Gary and his predecessors, interaction with the ever unpredictable practice of nitty gritty work in the re unreliable real world. And that's what we don't know so well. A second hallmark of anal historiography is stress on deep continuity and long, slow rhythms of change against the view that Spanish conquest caused complete rupture in the Amerindian technology of intellect, Erton saw how recording in fiber continued long into post-Inca times, and we've all been learning about that. I'm one of those who studied the long colonial life and afterlife of quipus. Partly through ethnography, How to advance the slide? Oh, okay. Got it. 1994 found me ethnographing in the mountainous province of Huaruchiri, south of Lima, striving to understand through fieldwork the one and only testament of Andean ritual and myth that we found recorded in an Andean language, the Huaruchiri. Quechua manuscript of probably 1608. While I was there doing that, a visitor told me that Gary Erton had started to publish about quipus. And that really made me sit up, and I'll show you why. Tupicocha, where I work, defines itself as a union of ancient groups called Ayus, or today parcialidades usually, that federated in pre-Hispanic times to make a village. We can think of the Ayus as patrilineal corporate descent groups. They still bear the names of the protagonist groups in the ancient Huarochiri source. The parcialidades are the constituents of what we call community, the recognized comunidad campesina, a state-recognized entity. But with or without the state, it can't take any action unless all the 10 presidents of the Ayus are in the room. They consist to about, of about 10 to 30 titular members representing households unequal in political potency, but each with its totemic banners, floral co cockades, and melodies has a specific fixed standing in the ritual order, and each has as its glory a quipu. Every year on January 2nd, all Tupicocha converges to perform a day of reckoning 
hosted by the Comunidad Campesina. It's called the Watancha, or the Wairona, as we've heard today. In the morning, every citizen gathers in a, an intimate, closed family reunion at which the deeds of the past year are discussed and the incoming officers are elected. After enjoying coca leaf and drinks and tobacco and music and hoisting their emblematic flag and other totemic emblems, each ayu leaves its patio and emerges holding its kipu high on a cushion and snaking its way through the foggy morning until intricately they all reach the public plaza called the Colca, which is the spatial arena of Comunidad. Each ayu then troops in to sit at its proper place, one segment of the front rows, marking on the ground with straw X's the places where kipus should rest. And then begins the day of reckoning. All officials, including the officials you already know about, plus people like NGO technicians and even religious volunteers have to step forward and render accounts for what they did in the past year. Two accountants examine the accounts rendered and this sometimes contentious audit takes up to two days. If it gets tough, the authorities even put a padlock lest the quorum disperse. And then comes the act that seals the new hierarchy and kicks off the new civic year. As the agenda ends, the outgoing presidents of IUs lift their respective kipus and drape them shoulder to hip on the new, new incoming dignitaries. At that moment, the old year finishes and the cycle is begun with a clean slate. Up to 1927, the six historic IUs were the owners of kipus. Three of these fissioned once or twice, leaving parts of their cord legacy to newer ayus. Also, two of the ayus, the original ones, have in addition to their display kipu, another one which they reserve because it's in bad condition. And finally, a couple of the younger ayus don't have any kipu, but they compensate for this loss of ritual dignity by making what they call simulacra. All Tupicochin kipus are of undyed animal fiber, mostly camelid. Dyed fiber occurs as threads that run through one ply or components of start knobs, these bulbous attachments on the main cords. And here they are. The early volumes of intra ayu records, intra ayu, not comunidad, regulated the same practices as the Kipu Wairona complex governed in earlier times, namely regulation of ayu member service to their kinship corporations and then each of the 10 ayu's services to the overarching higher government called the community. And to interpret all this, we need to bear in mind that all the kipus are parcialidad documents. None are comunidad documents. The extensive comunidad archives back to the 1880s never mention that level of authority ever holding kipus of its own. So when we study Tupicochin kipus, we are talking about the ayu viewpoint, 
And that's what I want to emphasize. So first of all, we need to break down what the IU viewpoint requires. The unit of accounting is the faena, or task. And it operated at two political levels. First, a cycle of mutual aid workdays among the members, so peer-to-peer -peer tasks. And second, service in n number of levies, which the higher community authority recognized, uh, required. The protocols for the lower level or mutual aid finance are the first and most explicit theme in the constitutions that the IUs wrote for themselves in 1920 and later years. And they have quite some resemblance to the entablo that we just learned from Sabine. At the second level, each IU's tasks included supporting fiestas, rebuilding irrigation works, building the community's own structures like the school, the colca. And from 1920s on, modern jobs like building roads, a stadium, a bull ring. President Leguia's famous national corvée to build highways was locally administered through the Ayus, as Arguedas remembers in Jawar Fiesta, and as Tello's secretary, Mejia Jespe, also explained in his notebooks. I was able to attend this kind of teamwork over and over. And it has a very established routine, which includes ritual modules at the beginning and at midday. And during this pause for sharing coca and several other things, that is when the record is created. It's this that is compiled in the intra IU books that have been literally piling up since the 1880s. Is this two-level faena, the administration of work that Wairona and Kipus did? After I had published some, some studies about this, Sabine Highland independently reported that patrimonial Kipus existed in other Wadochidi villages. In 2016, she published a remarkable paper that offered an important complement to Tupi Kocha, an unpublished description of Wairona written six decades before mine. Delving into the archives of Peru's canonical archeologist, Tello, she found notes that he had written in 1935 about the Wairona in Anchucaya, another village similar to Tupicocha and close to it. Highland has been kind enough to allow me to quote some of her unpublished transcript of Teo's original notes, but the translation is mine. Teo was born just over the hill from Tupicocha in the provincial capital. In 1935, he, heard, he wrote that he had already heard in 1914 that Anchukaya practiced the Watancha or Wairona. In 1935, or perhaps just before it, his interviewee, Mariano Pomajolka of Anchucaya, told him about the Huatancha, and Teo wrote notes at his own house in Miraflores. So in outline, I felt that my idea of why kipus belong to the Wairona, or annual self-audit, was confirmed. But how well does it square with the physical evidence of the kipus? Today we've become well-versed in the matter of seriated and banded kipus. Relaying Poma Jorca Sr.'s description, Tello tells us how the comunidad, not IU authorities, made a seriated kipu to, rec to record each of the six IU's respective performance on each of 10 
levees. Each series might have looked something like the seriated segments on this Inca quipu, not Antukaya, not Provenience, from the old Musée de l'Homme, as was. Knots on the six pendants of each bunch, as Teyu called them, showed the respective alus fulfillment or deficit. Absence of knots signified to him, as they seemed to me also, a clean account. Tupicocha has one sort of like this in overall pattern, though not in number numerical detail. Mujica I of Ayu Mujica. Its pendants occur in 16 iterations of a repeating series of four colors, but their pattern is less regular than what was, has been described by Teyo or seen in Inca materials. There's a lot to be said about this curious kipu, but I just want to point out right now that what I cannot square with the Teyo Pomahulka argument is that MO1's four chord sequences don't match Tupi Kocha's then six IU organization. I think this one, Mujica one is more likely to be an IU level document showing each of 16 Mujica members compliance with each of four duties, using colors to signify successive tasks. But if so, was it originally relevant to the white owner? And please meditate for a sec within yourself about the variety, physical dissimilarities among these chords, which we'll think about more later. Highland followed up on Teyo and Puma Hulka by applying a Teyo based explanation to an undated quipu that Teyo donated to the National Museum of Archaeology, Anthropology, and History, and which is numbered 21287, attributed by the quipu cataloger to Anchukaya. It has 14 diversely colored bands with five or six pendants in each. Highland, like Erton, held that color banded kipus like this are IU level internal records of individual members' contributions to meeting the requirements of government. So for Highland and her predecessors, each band would correspond to one member's contribution toward each of five or six levies. Tupicocha's banded keepers. Do resemble 21287 in fiber, design, color, ornament, and even the occasional inclusion of non chord objects. But the member band hypothesis is hard for me to apply. Not that I want to uh, consider. The, these final uh, opinions on the thing. Hard to apply because Tupi Kochen Kipu makers diverged so much from the neat Inca like ideal pattern of 21287. Its bands are much noisier than those in the Santa or Antukaya specimens. Some of them are relatively uniform in man manufacture, but even those have inconstant numbers of pendants in each group, which would be a tricky matter because it would become very hard to identify any single pendant with a task. It also, these also abound in interrupters and singletons, and sometimes it's even hard to distinguish band boundaries because they didn't make spaces between them. And the manufacture of cords is far less uniform than in the Santa Valley or Anchukaya specimens or so many others. There are disparities of, so to speak, of handwriting in knots, but primarily in the manufacture of cords, differences of diameter up to three to one. 
I find it hard to believe that these were made in neat batches such as the ones that we've studied here up to here. Pendants vary in tightness of spin, ply, twist, qualities of fiber, degrees of wear, and taper versus constant diameter. It looks to me like handwriting. I don't see how the factor of wear alone or of replacement of damaged cords would be enough to explain this. Here's the banding summary. There is, hard as this problem is, a suggestive uniformity at whole kipu level. In all Tupikochen kipus, as in Anchukaya, and even in some Inca or early post-Inca specimens, the number of bands doesn't wander far from 15. One of our earlier speakers mentioned that Gary Urton has also noticed this. To explain 15-ishness under a member band hypothesis, we I think knowing the way uh, Tupi Kocha works, we'd have to posit some controlling norm about how many titular members an IU should have. Because there's pressure for people to join, it takes ages. The IUs don't make it easy. Sometimes people have to wait into the beginning of middle age in the status of what they call proximos, or probationary members or applicants. So perhaps, to some degree, membership was kept. But I've never seen a normative statement about this. Alternatively, 15-ishness might be understandable under, under an intra-IU task band hypothesis, or maybe both hypotheses. There does seem to have been a norm about how many faenas an IU should do. In 1919, in its first intra-IU statute, the 14 members of Kakarima IU wrote that after they had walked 14 tasks, accounts would be opened again and the business meeting reviewed. This is one of those constitutions. The problem then becomes, how did intra-IU, intra-IU, not community, Bands distinguish between tasks formed for peers and for supra IU government. I can't answer it today, but I think at least we know what to look for. And as a last topic, I want to think for a minute about dualism and banding, a tale of bloodshed and reconciliation. How did the IUs change from six to 10? And do the kipus reflect those changes? Up to the 1920s, at least three of the historic IUs, like so many Andean organizations, internally consisted of two complementary groups within themselves. Each IU, okay, so let's start thinking now in terms of not a two, but a three level kipu and labor system, comunidad, ayu, and what is inside a kipu. Each of those ayus had dual kipus accordingly, and starting in the 1920s, they started to break up. Ayauca's two uh, kipus went to the present uh, ayus of Primera and Segunda Ayauca and so forth. There is some evidence that two of the other historic uh, IUs, which now lack them, had dual kipus. In one case, Parcialidad de Santa Fasca, the history of fission is known. From their alphabetical internal records. In 1923, Santa Fasca wrote an act of both societies, Huascar and Santa Fasca by which it recognized itself as having two subparcialidades. Santa Fasca's secretary, in these kind of notebooks, wrote about them as the two sexes 
of this partialidad. Certainly a metaphor powerfully attached to ancient structures of complementary dualism. In 1923, both sexes decided that on jobs commissioned by the, commu the comunidad, higher level, they would appear as a unified force. Every year, they jointly inter inventoried their pair of quipo camayos. The purposes of the internal sub-societies were tasks, okay, well, so we can think of the Rayu structure at that time as being like this. In 1925, when they had to apportion a particular hauling job, they defined themselves as complementary teams. Well, the subparcialidades took care of such matters as rules for sharing tools, supporting the dance of the sacred clowns, and constructing the new cemetery. Nice dualism. But the subsequent Satafasca story shows us that structural schemes of complementary dualism don't always work out peacefully. While repeating in 1925 the above tasks, the two Satafasca crews broke into hatreds and violence. In 1926, there occurred what was minuted as a small disagreement, uh, which is usually a euphemism for a total Donnybrook, uh, between the Huascar section and their opposites about work on Huascar Lake. There does exist a lake called Huascar, and it might be that the fight between the societies concerned unequal participation in irrigation improvements. That kind of conflict still occurs in Tupacocha. The group that would soon become known as Segunda Satafasca, Second Division of Satafasca, wrote in 1925, after a long discussion, hotly contested among the members, we agreed on a legal and voluntary resolution to separate the parcialidad and not allow joint function at any time with the persons who belong to the Society of Huascar. Within a year, each started calling itself a parcialidad. The group that would become Primera Santa Fasca wrote at their pre wairona meeting, their family reunion. And as of the year 1925, they, the other society, were separated by their own accord <laughs> and they took away the large cross, the crucifix, and a framed picture, and a quipo camayo. In all the conflicts and separation, they themselves asked for it, and we did not allow it, and they did not respect what's on record in this book on page one. Within the year, the comunidad recognized the fission, officializing the Huascar Society as Primera Satafasca and the Satafasquinos as Segunda Satafasca, and the paired Kipus parted ways. Notice that this is a political defeat uh, for, for the Sociedad de Santa Fasca. It's usually in Andean societies for the unmarked or dominant part of a pair to bear the name of the pair as a whole, and so they did. But after the split, the formerly first people became the last people. Is there a trace of this granular, very small scale history in the forms of the quipus? Documents tell us that the two groups worked on the same tasks at the same times, but in separate crews. I wonder if we can see something like that in the chords. Just on one occasion, the two satafascas allowed me to put their quipus side by side. 
Primeras Atafascans pendants are 93% Z-twisted. Segundas, 82% S-twisted. So they do look, by the criteria Erton first established, look like symmetrical mates. I kept looking. At the start of each, we find a single dissimilar band. It's not that unusual for members of a set to be dissimilar in their opening segment, so I postponed thinking about that. We notice that the marker tufts atop the main cord occur at close positions after pendant 59 and 55, respectively. From band two on, we see what, watching this until I cross eyed, we see what I think is a very roughly similar sequence of color bands. But I say very rough because opposite bands do not usually have the same fine structure of cordage nor the same number of pendants. It's plausible to think of bands as representing seniority statuses by similar conventions in both sides. So for example, color A might be the second most senior titular member and color B the third most and so forth. I emphasize statuses rather than persons because the continual entrance and exit of members would have discombobulated this system if the colors represented their personages rather than their ordinal number as it's called. Alternatively, the matched but physically distinguishable bands might stand for the sequence tasks. And here too, another case where the question is still here, but maybe a tad bit more defined. We don't know what happened at Lake Wascott in 1926-27. Whatever it was, Primera Satafasca remembered it as a tragedy involving loss of life. Was it homicide or accident? They didn't write it down, as people usually don't if they can help it. Lasting rancor with, against the sibling parcialidad to me suggests the former, a crime. 16 years after the fight in 1943, 16 years, Primera Satafasca wrote that they agreed to go out to the lake of Huascar for the day to get to know the work of our parents who sacrificed their lives. The fission of corporate descent groups is a common theme in classic anthropology, particularly African, and in mytho histories from many places and cultures, typically Ex post facto, separated groups come to see themselves as the progeny of estranged brothers. Brothers, because this is a patrilineal system. We've just seen Satafasca undergo what I would call an Isaac and Ishmael sort of fission, in which the trauma of splitting a kinship corporation eventually gives rise to a distanced but stable recognition between peer segments. In the old Genesis story, Ishmael and Isaac, after lifetimes of hatred, met again at the funeral of Abraham the patriarch. So too with Satafasca. Two years after this commemoration, perhaps the angry wound was healing because the sibling enemies made it up in honor of a higher authority. Being united, after a brief discussion, with the, united with the Huascar Society, with the partialidad of Primera Santa Fasca, so as to make ourselves one in affiliation. And how did they do that? By buying, respectively, a mattress and some bedclothes for a visiting di dignitary, a deputy, deputy of government. It's very pleasant 
to think about alienated segments reconciling in the basis, on the basis of higher authority through paired gifts, mattress and bedclothes, that sort of have the classical Andean attributes of duality, being unequal in rank, symmetrical in form, complementary in function. I don't think I can go further with this very patchy picture until we know the reason for the noisiness and the oddness of Tupicochin quipus in their fine detail. But I do feel that they've helped us see a little more about both the granular texture of annals like history the days with a shovel, and the big picture of how shapes mutate slowly but retain a profile almost forever. The structural fission that Santa Fasca suffered looks typical in regular in long durée uh, views of segmentary social organization. But when we add in the Ayllu's internal writings about them, we understand that to Sata Fasquinos, the chords registered an event history of traumatic rupture. They lived it as a drama of anger and reconciliation, which still has a kind of hushed and troubling moral significance even now. The bed that Sata Fasca bought might do for an emblem of the Andean, or maybe we should say Ertonian, way of making structured history. Anyway, it does work. 410 years after our earliest notice of Tupicocha, empires and governments have come and gone, but the Ayus and the Kipus are still here. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few minutes, I think. Shall we take okay. a couple of minutes for questions? We have time. We have a few minutes. Yeah. Can I have a question for tonight? I'll let you. Yeah. I was uh, really fascinated and, and, and thinking of ways to sort of add um, historical depth what you're describing here for the 1920s. Do you think that one of the reasons why um, this uh, sort of segmentation is so difficult to um, trace in earlier documents is because perhaps the word IU is being used to refer to the sociedades, the parcialidades, and the comunidades? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. IU is a... IU is the indispensable and difficult word. Mm -hmm. Because, like so many other basic words of Quechua lexicon, such as cocha, which is any body of water from a puddle to the Pacific Ocean, or such as yachta, which is anything from a neighborhood to the nation, it is a scalable term. It's the name of a kind of relation among entities rather than the name of an object. Um, and... Uh, Therefore, we find it, even in the ethnography of our own lifetime, we find it signifying different things in different places. Second reason that things are as just as asked is that when the system of sociedades works rightly, it works, it's almost invisible. Remember that the two sociedades agreed that they said for functions above our, our kinship scope, we appear as a single force. Fascinating to me that in Andean ethnohistory, we find mirroring and imaging, deepening and deepening levels of isomorphic organization so that our attempt at stereoscopic vision brings us to a view 
that's different and the same as what we started out with. Okay, Karen, shall we proceed? Uh, let's proceed. Okay.